Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for spending your lunch time with me today. So by show of hands, uh, everybody civil engineering here? Uh, everybody? So I, no, other, no other major? OK, so that's good. At least we can frame the conversation better that way. Uh, so I'm here to talk about uh, <clears throat> public transportation and its role in urban sustainability. Um, anybody familiar with sustainability? So that I don't have to explain. So everybody is familiar with that. Okay. So uh, of all the uh, public transportation here in the United States, um, it's all funded or managed through the Federal Transportation Administration, or FTA. Um, and according to FTA, uh, public transportation or transit's role in environmental sustainability are the following. So public transportation can improve air quality. I mean, given that LA had a history of uh, pretty bad air quality, I don't know if maybe your grandparents uh, still uh, tell you stories about back in the 60s, 70s. They used to have days when they're not allowed to go to school because of bad air in LA. Uh, but look at, look at the, our air now, it has improved a lot. But it still needs improving, so public transportation is key to one of those. Um, it reduces greenhouse gas emissions um, greenhouse gas emissions is mainly from the exhaust, the tailpipe exhaust from uh, buses and other forms of uh, transportation. If we drive our cars every day, we can actually all in this room can comfortably fit in one bus. But if we all drive our cars and all our cars are gas engines, none are hybrid or EVs, then you're basically multiplying your greenhouse gas emissions by about 20. It's that simple. So by riding the bus or by riding the train, we are reducing greenhouse gases. And I'll, I'll, I'll discuss more about greenhouse gases in the next slides. Uh, it facilitates compact development, conserving land, and decreasing travel demand. Um, LA is a perfect example. Um, who's the furthest among you here? Anybody live in San Bernardino or Riverside area? There you go. Uh, about what, an hour and a half on a good day? Oh, you go to Metro, great, awesome. Yeah, but if you drive, that's, that's really uh, a far distance. But LA is you know, spread out, it's wide. If you go to uh, places like Manhattan, New York, I mean, I have a brother who lives in Hong Kong, everything there is compact, everything is vertical. But they all have to use public transportation because owning a car is a premium. Parking is expensive, cars are expensive, gas is super expensive. Here in LA, Everything is affordable, everything is, it's, easy, it's so easy to buy a car. You don't even have a, sometimes you don't even need the down payment. <laughs> it's the only place in the world I know where you can get a car with zero down. Um, of course, using public transportation saves energy. Um, energy can be the form of electricity, can be the form of uh, oil, or any other fuel that you use on your vehicle. Uh, it, it also has socioeconomic benefits. By allowing public transportation, we are basically uh, equalizing the playing field. So everybody can go to work, everybody can go to places of entertainment, everybody can go to, play, to schools uh, with, with minimal um, expense. That's one of the big advantages of public transportation. And uh, mainly because FTA is funding a lot of public transportation projects. So the money you pay for the bus ride is really not enough to uh, pay for the bus and the fuel and the, and the uh, driver's um, salaries, but the FTA is giving money so that public transportation can continue to operate. And it, of course, minimizes environmental impacts. Um, a lot of, I mean, air quality is definitely an environmental impact. Um, I will discuss some of the projects at Metro, but uh, one of the things that we do is we turn formerly contaminated sites into public transportation hubs or facilities. Um, so that's one of the things that uh, uh, public transportation does. So greenhouse gases, um, everybody familiar with this? So I'll, I'll just do a, a very quick one. So here, are, uh, this is a normal condition. We have light coming from the sun. It gets in to the uh, Earth's atmosphere, gets converted into heat. And you know, almost half and half stays within the Earth and uh, <clears throat> the other half goes back into space. That's a typical condition. 
Uh, and this is the difference between the moon and the earth. Um, greenhouse gases is absent in the moon. That's why they're about 95 degrees negative. And we have a livable uh, temperature here. However, in an abnormal condition where you have more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, instead of half and half, we're basically getting you know, three quarters of the heat being trapped within the atmosphere and only about a quarter being uh, reflected back into space. So this is where you get uh, your uh, uh, climate change, global warming, whatever the term is. I mean, I'm not here to argue. I know some people uh, do not fully embrace the idea. But this is what's happening. Um, anybody heard about the LA's Green New Deal? Uh, last year, uh, probably about May or June, uh, Mayor Garcetti uh, re released the so-called LA's Green New Deal. And this table is from that, from that uh, <clears throat> document. Um, so it shows that greenhouse gases in LA from 2013 to 2017 we actually have reduced it by a little bit. But transportation, which is the yellow portion, is, uh, is a sizable chunk. I mean, it's not the biggest, but it's definitely uh, a sizable chunk of the greenhouse gases that are um, being generated by the city. So part of the objectives or the targets of the Green, Green New Deal is to reduce the GHG by 50% by 2025. I mean, we're only, five, we're only five years away from that. Um, so <clears throat> I'm not sure how they're going to meet that, but that's the target that they have. And one way of meeting the 50% GHG reduction is by using public transportation and other non-vehicular modes. So you'll, you're, you're seeing now more bike lanes being implemented downtown LA. There's a lot of bike rent uh, um, available now. Of course, scooters are, are there as an option too. Walking is the, is the main uh, push. So they're trying to um, move us more into public transportation and non-vehicular uh, modes of transportation to lower our uh, greenhouse gases. And uh, the, <clears throat> the reduction of uh, VMT, or vehicle miles traveled, they are aiming at 25% by 2025. So, by lowering the tra vehicle traverse mile by 24%, it will contribute quite a bit on reducing the greenhouse reduction by 50%. And eventually, they want to reduce the uh, VMT by 45% by 2050. So those are the uh, targets uh, when it comes to public transportation on the Green New Deal. I mean, it's, it's an interesting document. If you have time, uh, read it, be familiar with it, especially if you're planning to live and work here in LA for the next uh, 20 years or so. So part of that too is by introducing uh, electric or zero emission vehicles, ZEVs as we call it in, the, in our industry, 25% um, by 2025. So they wanted to change uh, the zero emission bus. And right now, uh, LADOT, I mean, I, I don't know if there, is there a dash that comes up here? Um, uh, so these are this this one here. This is the older version, LA DOT, LA Department of Transportation. They have a lot of that going around uh, downtown LA, um, and then there's they're already using um, electric buses now. Uh, so you see th this facility is um, uh, by the by the freeway near Alameda. Um, this is all solar up there, so uh, that's part of the charging mechanism for the buses. So they wanted to. The city of LA wanted to do uh, CEVs 25% of their fleet by 2025. And then slowly phasing them out, uh, I mean the, the, the non-CEVs, the diesel and the CNG ones, they want to phase them out by 2050. So if you're looking at a future career, definitely electric vehicles, electric public transportation is, is, a, is a very uh, upcoming um, uh, market that you might want to look into. I mean, for civil engineers, of course, it's not, it's not the bus itself, but um, you know, uh, preparing the infrastructure for that. Right now, one of the challenges that we are uh, facing is converting a lot of these uh, facilities that are uh, currently fueling diesel or CNG buses into electric. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, a lot of engineering work that needs to be done related to that. 
So that's one potential career path you might want to consider. Um, at LA Metro, so LA City was the, was the first several slides. So here at LA Metro, this is where I do most of my work. Um, I do a lot of consulting for LA Metro on the sustainability space. And uh, the next two slides, this and the next one, is basically showing some of the sustainability accomplishments of the organization. LA, LA Metro covers um, the whole LA County, but it is it's, uh, because of the passage of Measure M and Measure R, which is taking half a cent out of every sales tax in the county of LA, we are pulling about $170 billion in the next 30 to 40 years. And all of that is going to be spent in um, basically improving our public transportation system. And about 100 billion of that is, spent, is, is going to be spent in the next 10 years in preparation for the Olympics. So right now we're very busy, almost 24 seven. Uh, we're doing a lot of tunneling work to um, <clears throat> extend a lot of the uh, subways. We're building a lot of new light rail systems, bus facilities as well. So that's again, um, potential careers in the, uh, um, in the transportation sector. So here are some of the highlights. Um, I mentioned uh, about green building here. So back in about 2016, or 2017 I should say, Metro has uh, 11 LEED certified buildings. Um, anybody passes through Cesar Chavez? So at the corner of Cesar Chavez and Vignes, there's a new facility, Division 13. That's probably one of the greenest, um, mo most sustainable buildings in the LA portfolio for now. I mean, it has a lot of the, a lot of the features. Um, I'll, I'll explain later, there, there's a slide about that. So uh, LEED or green building, and also Envision. We have two Envision um, awarded projects uh, at that time. Um, so Envision is another certification that uh, are uh, slowly becoming an industry standard for those who wants to be in the uh, sustainability space, especially for civil engineers. Um, uh, so Envision is a uh, sustainability certification for projects in the infrastructure space. So if you're building something that is not occupied, then Envision is the way to go. If you're building a facility that will, that will be occupied space, then you go lead. So those two are, are the two you know, industry standards right now. So this is an occupied space because people will be spending an extended period of, of time here. So for a building like this, lead certification is the way to go. Envision is more open spaces, uh, public infrastructure, transportation. So a lot of the subways that we do are uh, rated under Envision, but for the maintenance facilities for the offices, for the headquarters building, um, also on the other side of Vignes and Cesar Chavez, that is a LEED certified building too. So those are um, certifications that you might want to look into if you want to go into that um, career path. Um, here's a, um, um, an improved version or the, the next phase of that uh, earlier um, slide. So this is uh, this one. This one is only up to um, you know projected 2019. So here we already added some of the some of the new things that we've achieved in 2019 and projecting them towards 2020. Uh, but here, uh, here it says 12 lead certified buildings. Uh, and then uh, two Envision projects. So we, ha we have uh, the two projects, uh, one of them is Expo Line, and the other one is the uh, Purple Line extension that were certified under Envision. Um, so we have, uh, uh, last year, the board of uh, Metro has approved a policy that will push the agency to do 100% ZEV, zero emission vehicles, in terms of buses by 2030. Uh, everybody's still scratching their heads right now, how, how are we gonna do it? Because uh, Metro has about, uh, about 2,000, almost 3,000 buses, and converting all of that into electric is a bit of a, uh, I mean, it's, it's a big challenge. It's a big challenge. One is the supply of the buses, and second is the facilities to support them. Um, <clears throat> we have, um, we don't have enough power produ produced, that's one way of looking at it. Uh, so 
uh, last year, uh, about July last year, I was part of the team that put together the uh, Metro Climate Action and Adaptation Plan. So this is an update from an earlier version um, in 2012. And the CAP um, is a document that uh, you know, we studied what are the climate impact of our operations and how can we can mitigate that or prepare for uh, eventual impact of climate on our operations. Uh, so for example, uh, this facility that's in the picture here, uh, this is Division uh, 15 in Sun Valley. And uh, if you see the hills here, before this, uh, after this picture was taken, these hills were on fire. And it, it wasn't in any of the plans. We didn't know, Metro didn't know how to react to a um, major uh, forest fire that would impact our operation. So it ended up that this facility was not accessible for three days because of that fire. It was not affected by the fire directly, but uh, because there were so many fire trucks operating in the area, it was unsafe for the buses to come in, in and out. So we had to shut down the operation there. So those are the things that we are, we kind of included on the uh, CAP 2019. What will we do if there's a forest fire? because we know that it will happen. It's just a question of how many times in the year. Uh, but if you look here, this facility has a lot of solar. Um, almost all of the roof were converted into solar, so it's in preparation for converting all of those buses to electric. Right now, there's no electric bus operating in this facility. And here is a, a picture of the first um, electric bus that Metro received last year. Uh, this bus will be, although it's colored silver, um, it will be running on the orange line. We have received about 18 buses, electric buses so far. So if you look at the timeline, we have received uh, 18 buses uh, in 29, uh, 2019, but we want to do 2,000 plus buses full electric by 2030. The math doesn't, you know, add up. But we're, we're still doing our best to meet that uh, objective by the board. So um, here uh, on the cap, we said that uh, we want it to be zero emission by 2050. Zero emission by 2050. And this is including all of the vehicles within Metro, not only the buses, but also the non-revenue, the, the, the cars that are being used by the uh, supervisors or uh, the cars that are being used by, uh, when the, the trucks that are being used by the folks who maintain the facilities or who do the repairs, even the tow trucks that are used for the buses, uh, they want to convert. They want to convert them or into zero emission uh, by 2050. And then, in in line with that, we also want to buy 100% renewable energy by 2050. Uh, <clears throat> that is also still another big challenge. Uh, because uh, right now, DWP, which supplies most of the power to uh, metro facilities, are still about 30% um, renewable energy. So we're, st we're all uh, trying to uh, do our best. So that's a lot of challenges for the engineers in the future to uh, help us produce more of that power. Uh, so in addition to what was mentioned in the earlier slides, uh, part of the program to do zero emission by 2050, Metro wants to install PV systems wherever it's possible. Uh, we wanted to install water saving features, uh, install non-potable um, recycled water system, LED lightings wherever it is uh, practical, uh, where it's allowed by regulations, installing electrical heating systems instead of uh, uh, propane, uh, and then also by replacing the uh, appliances within the facilities to more efficient uh, electric appliances. So if you can see here, this is part of one of our field trainings where we are showing uh, um, th these are uh, uh, workers, uh, facility maintenance workers from Metro, and we are showing them how to maintain uh, the solar panels that were installed um, on one of the facilities. And this is the Division 13 facility that I was uh, mentioning earlier. Um, so on this side that faces Cesar Chavez, you'll see there's a lot of PV. So it's a combination of PV and solar, uh, solar water heaters as well. On top of that building, there's also a, um, <clears throat> a green roof 
for the workers to uh, relax and uh, enjoy. And uh, if you see this building in the back, anybody know, knows who, what that building is? Uh, that's the prison facility. Uh, so when we were designing the building, we found out that every six months, the prison facility throws away about 10,000 gallons of water because it's part of the regulation. They have to have enough water to supply the prisoners uh, enough for 72 hours if there's an emergency. So every six months, they throw away that water down the drain. So what we decided was we're going to get that water and use that for washing the buses. So we get free 10,000 gallons of water every six months from the prison facility because it's clean water anyway. But they, they used to be just throwing down, down the uh, sewer. So we, this, this facility is now receiving that water and using that for uh, uh, domestic and bus washing mainly. So we're coming up with those innovative ideas. If you go for a LEED certification, part of the LEED credits will be to come up with innovative ideas like that. Um, so, so you could get your building certified. So this building, uh, Division 13, was originally designed to be lead silver. But because of the innovative points that we were able to implement, we actually was able to get it uh, certified for gold, lead gold. Uh, here are the other projects that are ongoing. Uh, Crenshaw LAX, this is uh, pro the project that I spend most of my week, about 30 hours of my week is spent at Crenshaw LAX line. So this one it connects the uh, Expo line that goes to Santa Monica with the green line that passes through the 105 freeway. And it also uh, passes very close to the airport without touching the airport. Uh, and then there's another line that will be connected to that. The people mover will bring you into the airport. So in the future, once you come out of your airplane, um, by the way, they, you will now have to pay to drive into the airport. So you'll have to uh, pay a toll to go and pick up and drop off. So they're trying to discourage people from doing that. That's why we're building all these train systems. <clears throat> and also when the Olympics come, in, come to town, most of the tourists will, will not have um, the option to drive. Anybody taken an inter uh, a flight uh, out of LAX recently after they've implemented the new system? So now that the Uber and Lyft are outside of the terminal. So, so they're adding that complexity to discourage you from, from driving in or using um, cars to get into the airport because they want you to use the, the shuttle system. Uh, regional connector, this is also an ongoing project from Little Tokyo, first, first in Alameda to 7th uh, and Hope. So this will allow the blue line coming from Long Beach to come to uh, Little Tokyo and also connect with the gold line. Um, <clears throat> Metro Purple Line extension from Koreatown, West, Wilshire, and Western will now bring you all the way to UCLA and then to the VA hospital. Eventually, it will go all the way to Santa Monica. But for now, before the Olympics, we're aiming to open the line that goes all the way to the VA hospital by the 405 freeway. Uh, this is the uh, Gold Line East extension. Uh, at the moment, Gold Line ends uh, along the 210 freeway in uh, Azusa. So this will add six new stations from Azusa to Claremont. And eventually, the gold line will go all the way to uh, Ontario Airport so that you can actually go from one airport to the other by using the, the, the train system. That's the ultimate objective. Uh, on the eastern side here, um, for the gold line, it will also go around and connect, with the, uh, uh, connect at the Ontario Airport. So gold line will actually be a full circle. Um, probably uh, your grandkids will, <laughs> will be the ones to ride those. I may not see it in my own time. Um, so the next few slides are some of the uh, um, <clears throat> trips that I've taken related to the work that I do for Metro. So I've, I've visited uh, several, a lot of places in the world, um, and I'm going to show you what the other cities in the world are doing when it comes to uh, uh, zero emission vehicles. So this one is in Madrid. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a minibus, uh, about 12 people can fit there uh, with a driver. And they have been operating these buses for the last 15 years. Uh, the photo on top there shows the chargers in, in one of their facilities. They, they uh, originally envisioned that these uh, buses will be the one going around the city, but they have encountered a lot of operational issues, mostly on the battery. Um, uh, Madrid is... Uh, uh, more humid than LA, 
So the temperature definitely affects the battery performance, but also during the winter, they also get colder than, than LA. So during the cold months, the battery will take a while to get its maximum power. And then during the warm months, the battery power just goes faster because the chemistry is affected by the, by the ambient temperature. So they're still trying to solve that. So they, they haven't implemented this same buses to go around the city. But recently, uh, only last month, they started what they call Linea Zero, um, which is a dedicated line that on, only runs uh, within the city, but they're using uh, bigger buses than this. And uh, <clears throat> they, ha they, are only, they, they, they stayed away from um, charging within the city. They're only charging at the depot, because that was one of the challenges they had, uh, was the, the battery power should be able to run an entire route. So that's in Madrid. Uh, in uh, Cologne, Germany, um, <clears throat> they have this uh, different technology here. They call this uh, a pantograph. So the buses, if, if you've taken uh, Blue Line or Gold Line, any of the light rail lines that we have here in LA, it has a similar technology. Um, a, um, a connector system basically goes up and charges the bus whenever it's at the bus stop, uh, when there is a pantograph. Uh, available. But when they're in the depot, they use this charging, uh, which is basically a plug-in system. So during the night, when the buses are, are in the depot, they connect it to the, uh, the, the plug-in. But when they are uh, within the city, um, not all stops, but uh, whenever, whenever there is um, a facility for that, while they're loading and unloading, they do connect the pantograph to charge the battery more. So it can run uh, further. And then also, they've converted their non-revenue fleet. Uh, this is actually a Ford, um, but this is in Germany. They don't have BMWs in their <laughs> service fleet. They're all Fords. Um, they are charging them as well through plug-in technology. So they have not only implemented bus, uh, zero emission buses, but also non-revenue um, <clears throat> system that they have. Uh, here in Helsinki, uh, Finland, they are using a different technology. Here at the stop, oh, this is my daughter, by the way. <laughs> um, so they have a, uh, a magnetic induction. Uh, the, anybody charges their phone uh, without putting the wire in? So similar technology. So when the bus stops, there is a charger underneath. So it doesn't have to physically uh, connect. But this also has the option to connect the pantograph. So they can do both. If they if they really if the if, if the uh, driver sees that the battery is really running low, they can do both charging at the same time. Um, but this is very experimental. They only ha they have a local uh, manufacturer uh, called Linker. I visited their facility there, and their production is six buses a year. So it's that, it's that complicated. It takes them a year to make six buses. So here in LA, we wanted to do 2,000 plus buses in 10 years. So definitely, we need a, a bigger support than that. Uh, in, in UK, um, they have one dedicated line. So if you go visit, uh, um, you know, if you want to take the London Eye, uh, this is line 51. So it runs uh, within that from, the, from Big Ben which is uh, shown in this photo here. So it, it runs in the tourist, mostly tourist spots. <clears throat> so they're using it as a, um, a, a showpiece. Um, so they did, what they did was a combination of technologies because they know not one company has the solution. So they basically had the bus uh, designed by a local company, Alexander Dennis, and the powertrain system, including the batteries, um, was provided by BYD, which is a Chinese company. Uh, they didn't want to allow BYD to bring in their fully, you know, fully made buses because some of them do not meet the safety requirements of UK. So they said, why don't the two of you um, work together? <clears throat> but because of the challenges in installing charging uh, during the route, they're, they're, I mean, London is an old city. Anywhere you dig, you'll, you'll, get, you'll encounter some issues. So they decided that from a technology perspective, they're only using plug-in. So the, on, the only place they have is plug-in at the end of the routes. So no pantograph, no magnetic induction, because they don't want to do any digging. They only charge at the end. 
So they have programmed their system in such a way. And then here, this is a, an artist concept of what the future will be. I mean, um, <clears throat> London is known for the double-decker buses. Um, so th that's the future design that they're going to have as part of this program they have in London. Um, moving to the other side of the planet, this is in Kaohsiung, where I attended the Eco Mobility in 2017 in Kaohsiung, Taiwan. Uh, so this is their electric bus made by a local manufacturer, uh, Leon. And then they also have um, e-scooters. Talking about the issue of air quality, Taiwan was faced with very bad uh, air quality problems because they have so many of these scooters running on the older two-stroke uh, technology. So that, uh, the exhaust on a, on a two-stroke engine is pretty bad. So they, the government came up with a program that they buy back the old two-stroke two engines and give you a, an e-scooter. And then they have charging stations on almost every street corner, more than any Starbucks. So you can, you, when you buy this, it comes with two battery packs. Oh, sorry. Um, it comes with two battery packs, and you can swap it out. You don't have to wait for it to charge. When you go to the, to the machine, you just plug in your, your depleted battery. It comes out a fully charged battery, and then you go, on, you go on and do your thing. So you don't have to charge at home. All you have to do is uh, swap out your batteries. And then it was my first time to ride an autonomous vehicle. Everybody is you know, kind of iffy here in the US about autonomous vehicle. In Taiwan, they're embracing it. Because what they have is a fully um, integrated system. So if you want to go into the main parts of the city, you take the light rail. So that's your long distance, or you take the bus. But for your first mile and last mile, these are your solutions. This runs, into a, runs in a very defined route. And it has detectors um, for animals. I mean, uh, in some parts of Asia, uh, dogs and cats run all over the place, chickens too. So this can detect those. So it will stop uh, to make everybody safe. Uh, it can carry about 12 people, and it has no drivers. Um, so one charge of this vehicle can, can run the, uh, the minibus for about five hours on a continuous route. So it brings you from the bus stop to the train stop into the different parts of the neighborhood using the autonomous vehicle. Um, and of course, um, China is the one with ha with ha with which has the most electric buses or zero emission um, public transportation in the world today. Um, this was in my visit in Shanghai in April last year. Uh, this is a magnetically levitated train. Anybody familiar with that technology? Yeah, so uh, apparently, I'm not 100% I'm not sure, but the, the claim is this is the only commercially operating maglev technology anywhere in the world. So from the airport to the city center in eight minutes. If you see here, I took a picture of the, of the display. It was running at 300 kilometers per hour. I mean, do the math. You can convert it to miles, but it's still a very high speed. So imagine what you can accomplish with eight minutes traveling 300 kilometers per hour. So it's almost like me coming from say Fontana, coming to downtown LA in probably 10, 15 minutes. So it's that fast uh, and very efficient. So uh, they, uh, China holds the record for the most uh, electric buses in, the, in, in operation. Shanghai is second to Shenzhen. Shenzhen is the one with about 16,000 buses on the street, electric buses. Um, Shanghai, 50% uh, of about 20,000, so about 10,000 of their buses are ZEV. But aside from that, they also have 7,000 other ZEVs that deliver mail. Taxis are also electric. And they also have an available uh, fleet of uh, rental vehicles. And that's all I have. So I'm open for questions. Great. Thank you. Yes. So it looks like other countries are ahead already with the electrical vehicles. Why yes. do you think the U.S. is so far behind? Well, one is um, uh, adoption um, and regulations. In China, it's a communist country. The government can actually say, do this, and everybody will follow. Here in the U.S., we have to go through processes. There's a lot of approvals. There's a lot of permits. 
there's a lot of environmental and safety requirements, um, which uh, that, that's one of the challenges in implementing new technologies. I mean, uh, we invented a lot of the things, but we don't even have high-speed rail here in California. We're, we're trying to build one, and it's already, what, uh, 300 billion <laughs> or something? The price is so uh, unbelievable. Um, so that's one. Uh, Europe, they've always been ahead of us when it comes to sustainability. So their, their push is always protecting the environment. In fact, um, in, in Europe, before you sell a chemical, any chemical or anything with a chemical, you have to prove that it's safe. Here in the US, it's the, the other way around. You can sell the product, and if nobody files a lawsuit, then you're safe. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the difference. So in Europe, they are that ahead. So there's this technology that I've, been, uh, that I've showed you about electric buses, they've, they've already embraced this like 10, 15 years ago. We are only starting to learn it now. In fact, uh, American bus companies are just starting to shift into uh, electric buses, where um, in Europe they already have a lot of uh, manufacturers, even Mercedes-Benz have their own electric bus technology. Volvo has their own electric bus technology, but there are no um, American companies that are still involved in electric buses. So uh, we, we kind of, we're, we're lagging in that, in that sense. And also the government support part. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be political, but there are people in Washington who doesn't even believe that the climate is changing. In Europe, they've accepted that as a fact. And therefore, they're, doing, they're trying their best to mitigate the environmental impacts. Here, we're still arguing, is it happening or is it not happening? <laughs> so that, that's my quick answer to the question. Any more? Yes? Uh, well, the, the TGV is, uh, is a different technology from maglev, uh, magnetically levitated. Um, I mean, uh, Japan is probably ahead of the curve when it comes to high-speed trains. Uh, and also, it, it, uh, safety. Um, you've heard of the Shinkansen line? So that's, that's the fastest you know, bullet train um, that goes from Kyoto to uh, Tokyo. And that has been operating since 1960s, and zero accident. Zero accident. I mean, you've seen how many accidents have happened here in the LA area on the Metro Link, right? <laughs> Vehicles getting star st stalled on the on the rail line, you know, the trains hitting each other. So there's a lot of technologies out there. Um, so it just so happens that maglev, this is specific technology of magnetically levitated train, apparently, uh, I'm not, I'm, I have I have no way of confirming it. This is the only commercially operating one. Uh, and you can see the difference. Once, once you're in there, and then once they, they turn on the engine, you will feel the train go up by about maybe a foot. And then you will, you will feel the speed uh, is very different because of that. The, the, the rail and the train are not in contact with each other, so there's no friction. You're not countering against friction. I mean, from an engineering perspective, that's definitely a big, a big uh, difference. So yes, uh, there's a lot of European technologies out there too, but uh, they haven't had any maglev. Yes? Is there any disadvantages with the electrical scooter? Like, because I know that in many countries that electrical scooter has been applied. Like for example, even in India it was applied, but it was a big flop. Mm. It didn't work because there was a lot of problems with the charging, that's one. Mm -hmm. One of their most biggest problem was the speed part. Yeah. Because the traffic problem will be too much if the speed is slow. Mm -hmm. So is there any you know, ongoing thinking that how we can keep the traffic running through? Because if someone is driving, say, an electric scooter, but someone on the other hand is driving an electric car, yeah. and it's fast, so there can be congestion, etc. Well, one is uh, grade separation. Um, in, in Taiwan, there are dedicated lanes for motorcycle, and there are dedicated lanes for cars. So that's definitely one solution. Uh, in terms of speed, um, the, I mean, the e-scooter e that I mentioned is not the scooter that we see here, not, not the bird or the lime, but it's, to them, it's the little motorcycle. The speeds are, are comparable. Uh, I mean, just like Tesla is comparable to any, uh, any regular cars. So I, I didn't see any difference, but the government just came up with a, with a 
with a regulation saying no more uh, uh, two cycle engines. So they basically phase them out. So the government also has to step in like that. Unfortunately, that's one of the challenges here in America. We are very empowered. We, we have every right imaginable. So we can fight change. And uh, sometimes that's one of the challenges. And also the charging, that's in Kaohsiung, you go to almost, uh, so there's only two providers of the electric uh, uh, scooters. One of them is Gogoro. And uh, when, when they designed their um, batteries, they thought it will only last 400 cycles, 400 charge and discharge cycles. Most of their e-scooters are already approaching 1,000 cycles, and they're still running. The charge and discharge uh, characteristics are still optimal. So they, they were even able to overshoot their technology um, <clears throat> targets. But in terms of charging, they have the two competing uh, companies have chargers literally on almost every street corner. So you don't have to worry about adding a charger at home or looking, you know, driving around looking for charger. To this day, you know, that's the problem with the electric vehicles here in, in California is because you always have to look for where the chargers are. I mean, there's apps that show you where, but in Kaohsiung, you don't even have to because you just get the next corner, there's a charger, you swap your battery. You don't even have to uh, wait you know, three minutes because once you plug it in, a new one comes out and off you go. So yeah, it, they just thought of it in a very efficient way and they were able to execute it. But that's only in Kaohsiung though. In Taipei, it's not the same story. So in Taipei, some of the challenges that you mentioned, they're also f facing that. But I guess it also helps when you're experimenting in a smaller geographical area. I mean, there's a lot of things that works in Singapore, but will not work here in LA, because this is just such a big place. While Singapore is a very controlled environment. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's definitely a lot of challenges there. And that's why they need a lot of engineers like us to solve those problems. So we're, we're not gonna run out of work. Any, any more questions? Yes, sir. I have a couple. So, um, parking pavements. Uh, what are the opportunities to, uh, maybe a crazy idea, having a pavement system on the road that can charge vehicles automatically as they travel, or uh, at the, you know, adapting pavement systems for autonomous vehicles, or you know, some sort of communication between the road and and the and the vehicle to find the routes. We don't have the snow problem here, but then when the the road is covered in the snow, you you can't see the lane marks, so you might be able to uh, to route you know efficiently for for the autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any thoughts on those? Well, that, that, that's why the photo in Helsinki, so when they started out, they first came up with the magnetic induction. Okay. They didn't have the pantograph at first. But they, when winter came and they got hit with blizzard, uh, two foot of snow, the bus cannot charge. That's why they said, okay, now, now we have to put another option. We have to put a pantograph because snow will definitely disable the, the magnetic uh, induction system. That's why they came up with that solution. So again, engineers came up with a solution. <laughs> um, about the uh, autonomous vehicles, I think pavement may, may be a bit impractical to be the solution to that. Um, <clears throat> in, the, in LAX, one of the projects that I did was the next gen. So uh, believe it or not, in speaking of uh, adopting new technologies, so we invented, uh, America invented uh, <clears throat> air traffic control and radar, right? To this day, we're still using ground-based radar system. That's why if you're in downtown LA, you see planes swerving towards downtown and then coming around because the ground radar systems are led, making them follow that route. But the next phase of the, uh, the next gen for the airports will now be GIS-based, so it's basically satellite. Right now, the airplanes in the US are still not using the satellites to navigate. So that's one solution that is already being tested in other countries. I, I know in France, they're already testing that. They've already sent out a constellation of satellites to help autonomous vehicles navigate using GPS on satellites, so not on the pavement itself. In terms of charging, um, <clears throat> we have, uh, at, at Metro, we heard a proposal about putting chargers not on the pavement, but on the sides of the road. Um, so w where it will be practical, I don't know, either on the side of the road or above 
but basically using uh, similar technology to magnetic induction uh, because repairing and put, putting the chargers on the road would be too expensive and it will be too um, disrupting to, to stop the traffic and put those chargers. But if you put it along the sides and on top, you know, where the road signs are, um, similar to the same technology when uh, RFID, um, when, when we're using fast track in the uh, express lanes. So they're going to kind of adapt the same uh, methodology so you can actually charge using that technology. So I think that's, um, in terms of pavement, I haven't heard a lot except for the magnetic induction. But one of the challenges when we looked at that here in LA is the excavation. Um, it's too disruptive to excavate and put that in. Nobody has invented a charging mat yet that you're just gonna roll it out and put glue on it. <laughs> Another opportunity for engineers to come up with. <laughs> if you invent that, you're going to be a billionaire. <laughs> yes, sir. Actually, that was my point. Like, is there any technology we have researched that which has, you know, you can put it on the footpath and people walk and, you know, there is some energy that's... Uh, if you've been to the Gold Line, uh, what station is this? Highland Park, I think, mm -hmm. along the Gold Line. So we did, we put a test like that. So when people step on it, a light will turn on. But you have to really dance on it. I mean, I don't know if you remember Dan Dance, 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 Dance Revo, in order to come up with enough charge to power your cell phone. So uh, what we've tested on some of the metro stations is put uh, stepping pads, um, and just to measure how many amperes or voltage it can generate. But the technology is not there yet. It cannot create enough. Um, at metro, um, what we uh, successfully tested in terms of alternative energy is when the, when the trains come into the station, there is a, um, uh, a mag uh, not a magnetic, but more of a mechanical system that captures the braking. Instead of them, instead of the disc brakes uh, connecting with each other, there is a uh, uh, sort of a pulley that connects to the train and absorbs that energy and winds it up. Remember, I mean, when I was a boy, uh, when I was a little, uh, we used to have um, toys that you wind up like that, and then when you release, it goes forward. It's the same technology. So when the train comes into the station, a hook goes into the side of it and captures that inertia. And then it also helps the train stop. And then once the train is ready to go, the power is being given, or the push is given on the back. So it's a mechanical system, but uh, it, it, we've tested it on the red, red line. It works perfectly. So that's one of the low-tech solutions. But there's a lot of opportunity to invent something. And also at Metro, there is now an office of extraordinary innovation, as we call it. And with that office, if you have an idea that you wanted to test on the Metro system, all you have to do is submit a two-page abstract, and they will consider it. And if they think it's something that, they, that is worth testing, they'll, they'll give you the opportunity to, to test it. And I've seen a couple of those already uh, take off from from uh, pilot to actual implementation. So there's at least two inventors out there who's going to make a couple of million bucks in the next several years. Which one? Okay. The Office of Extraordinary Innovation? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so. So uh, just one more question. Yes, sir. Uh, in terms of uh, energy providing payments, I guess they, they built a, a, a test road Mm -hmm. uh, that was it, it was a road basically uh, made of solar panel panels that uh, it worked for I guess for a few months and they, they, they didn't consider the, the friction uh, problems and then the, the, the dusting problems uh -huh. the but anyways, uh, can you please also uh, elaborate a little bit more about the envision uh, training and licensing program uh, process that uh, civil engineering students uh, after they, they pass their FE exam and probably going for the PE, how they can implement Envision uh, licensing uh, in their career? Yeah, so uh, Envision is um, uh, managed or implemented by uh, a third party organization called ISI, Institute of Sustainable Infrastructure. Um, so they, uh, ASCE, American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, is also closely working with ISI. In fact, every two years we have a, um, a conference, uh, 2019, we did it here at the Biltmore, uh, which is, it's called ICSI, International Conference for Sustainable Infrastructure. Um, so we discuss a lot of the new technologies that are out there 
and what are the sustainable um, features that we can add. Um, LA County Department of Public Works uh, and, and LA City um, uh, Bureau of Engineering also adopted uh, Envision as their preferred rating system. So just like LEED, it has credit. It has credit points. But uh, this, uh, but Envision is a little bit different because it goes all the way to uh, from, from project concept, conceptualization all the way to the completion of the project during the operation. Sorry system. to interrupt. Is everybody familiar with LEED? Do you know what, what is LEED? Can, can you also? Oh, yeah. oh, so, so LEED is Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. So as I mentioned earlier, LEED is a certification for buildings, for occupied space. So schools, uh, homes, offices, uh, those are the ones that go for LEED certification. And that is uh, managed by US Green Building Council. Uh, <clears throat> which I'm also an active member of the LA chapter. So if you're going to design and build a space where, you, where people are going to be occupying it for an extended period of time, then LEED is your main option. So both, both of these uh, LEED and Envision has uh, different categories and credits within them. So one, for example, one common among them is brownfield redevelopment. If you're building in a uh, previously contaminated site, then you get that credit. Um, the, the only difference is the, the, the backup documents that you have to submit. And uh, <clears throat> of course, both of them discourages uh, developing areas that are virgin. So they don't want you to build in uh, the forest areas. They want you as much as possible to repurpose an area that has already been previously developed. So as much as possible, don't open new areas. Definitely do not develop in wetlands. Do not develop where you know, there are swamps or, or natural habitat for, um, for animals, for flora and fauna. So that's one, and, I'm, and I'm, that's one part that I'm very uh, active on because of my previous experience in, um, in contaminated site remediation. So if you do a remediation on a site, former gas station, uh, former refinery, uh, then you get uh, a big plus there. If you're using, um, in, on lead, if you're using materials that are local, local meaning within a 100 mile radius, or regional, which is within 500 mile radius, then you also get some added points. If you have people who are lead professionals, lead green associate, or, or lead uh, APs, then you get another uh, set of credits. If you put uh, alternative energy, uh, solar panels, or uh, geothermal power, or any green energy, you get uh, another, point, another credit. And then there are different Categories. So if you are uh, aiming for LEED, um, the lowest one is uh, LEED certified. Uh, I forgot the point numbers. Uh, I don't memorize it on top of my head, but there's a number of credit points you have to meet. There are some prerequisites. Those are the, the, the things that you have to do before you can get additional credits. If you don't meet the prerequisites, even though you have the additional credits, you're not entitled to it because you're not meeting the prereqs, which is similar to how you enroll in college anyway. Um, and then uh, next to certified, uh, there is uh, silver, and then you have gold, and the highest point is platinum. Um, on Envision, the, the categories or the, or the grades are a little bit different. Uh, there is uh, enhancing, restora restorative, and uh, what's the other one? So, uh, so basically, the idea is if you're, if you're impacting the environment about the same way as a typical building, then that's, that's kind of like the lowest category. And then the next category is if you are improving the situation. And then the, the highest category is you're basically reversing the previous impact on the site. Um, most of the infrastructure um, for, for Metro, like the subways that we're building, um, the uh, stations where there's no offices, are going after Envision. And uh, for LA County, they have, uh, th there was a, uh, a project in South Central LA where they uh, revived a former, um, li like a migratory bird uh, habitat. Um, so that's one that I remember for LA County that they did. Um, so, so whenever there's, it, it's not a space where people are going to live and work at, then Envision is definitely your choice uh, to go for that. So, LA Metro is encouraging uh, people to go and uh, get those certifications. In, in, in fact, they are giving discounts. If you want to take the exam, um, 
uh, on your next visit for the Sustainability Council, uh, I'll connect you with Stacy. Or uh, I'm not sure if it's Stacy is still the one in charge, but there, there is. Yeah. So, so for students, they do give a, a special discount for those classes. Uh, for there's there's another one. G Pro is kind of like the intro to lead. So if you're not sure whether it's something that you wanted to pursue, uh, I would suggest you take your G Pro first, and then take your lead. But for Envision, um, it's a little bit of a, I would say higher level. I would say you start with your with lead, and then if you think that you're going to go more on infrastructure rather than occupied space, then that's the only time you go for Envision. I wouldn't advise you go for Envision right away, especially if you're not sure which part of the market you're going to go into. Do you need a PE to take the Envision? No, no it's not. Um, I, I, uh, I guess I'm a certified trainer. Um, there are people who attend my class uh, that are not, they're not even in the engineering field. Um, because Metro is uh, pushing towards Envision certification for most of the new projects that we are doing, we are encouraging a lot of the employees to come in so that we can have an open conversation with them. So even those who are in the procurement side, on the contract side, so that when they get the submittals or when they read bids, they understand what the contractors are bidding on. That's why we're encouraging everybody to come in and, and take the classes. And then it's your choice whether you want to go for the certification exam or not. But just attending the classes is already a big, a big plus. But I mean, for your generation, um, as I said, Metro is, a, is, a spa, is programmed to spend 170 billion on improving the public transportation infrastructure. If you're in civil engineering, Metro, I would really, really uh, recommend you look into that as a, as a career option. Uh, and <clears throat> LA is just one example. Almost every major city in America is trying to improve their public transportation because we are late. We are very late on the public transportation, so it's definitely a huge market uh, that you can uh, look to build your career on. And a lot of the uh, other cities in the world are also looking um, at you know, hiring those that have experience here. Um, I have a lot of buddies who used to work on projects here, and, and currently they're doing a lot of projects in, in other parts of the world. Um, <clears throat> I was just telling... Uh, AJ, earlier, I have friends who did work at uh, Istanbul International Airport after we've done work at LAX. So they do have, a, even though we're kind of late, they still have a high respect for those who have trained and worked in the American market. And they pay a premium. I mean, I've, I've had projects in the Middle East where they pay me three times <laughs> the salary <laughs> for the people they hire from other countries, just because I'm coming from California. So, I mean, unfair, but. Uh, that's just the market, you know? Uh, if the market is giving you that opportunity, why not take it? So. Any other questions? Okay, great, thanks so much. Thank you.